Uh, let's bring our uh, next speaker onto the stage. I really respect this guy. I lo absolutely love the book. And those that watch my YouTube channel uh, know I like to listen to him on tape. And it's not even that often. But uh, this book uh, really helped me understand several things about money. And uh, please welcome Saifedean to the stage. And his book is uh, right there in a story. He'll be happy to sign it for you after. All right, Saif, click right there. And you're up. Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me, Tone, and everybody from the organizers, and everybody who's here. Thank you so much for showing up and giving up on a wild night yesterday to wake up early today and be fresh to listen to me talk to you about the Bitcoin standard, only to get scammed and <laughs> be given a talk about the fiat standard, which is basically you know, a cheap imitation, as you can imagine. But it's what you're stuck with for the rest of this talk. Um, basically, this is the topic of my next book. If you remember my uh, first book, The Bitcoin Standard, if you'd read it, you might remember, you know, the first seven chapters don't even talk about Bitcoin. It's about monetary history. And, you know, up until the seventh chapter, you could have written the book in, say, the year 2000. And then, instead of moving on to discussing Bitcoin, you moved on to discuss the fiat standard, how the fiat standard actually worked. So with the benefit of foresight, of knowing how an actually civilized, advanced monetary system like Bitcoin, under the fiat standard. And so effectively, you see that there is the, um, you know, we came to the fiat standard from the gold standard under which we had this monetary system that was, um, you know, uh, obviously here comes all of the pro-gold stuff that uh, Bitcoiners don't like, but I promise it won't be a lot. But essentially, the important thing was that because it was the hardest money, it was the one that was used, and it was being used by central banks all over the world, and all banks were using this one money that nobody controls, so it was international. And foreign exchange didn't exist. It was one international um, monetary standard for money. And governments in that world couldn't just print money. They had to earn it like everybody else. And so... That meant if they ran out of money, if they spent their money on stupid nonsense, they faced serious consequences, and the consequences came up pretty early. And so after then, after World War I, governments began to take over the monetary systems that were centralized in their central banks at that time. Of course, initially it was temporary, and like everything temporary by government, it takes at least 100 years to figure out how to uh, disable it. Um, but I think we have. Uh, that's the important thing. But by 1971, you know, we went on this fiat standard. Money was not even nominally tied to gold. The value of money had nothing to do with value of gold, supposedly. And so then we, you know, it's complicated to discuss how this relationship happened and really ultimately who cares about the drama behind the developers and the node runners of that monetary system, about how they arrived at what they do, whether it was the banks taking over the uh, governments or governments running the central banks. It's all one, you know, one big giant um, ugly bastard child that they earthed, which is this combination of a monopoly central bank, which is the government protects the central bank and you have this horrific combination of four things that is um, that, that are essentially the, m the essential functions of what a central bank does, or particularly the central bank's cash reserve. So this central bank government body, which embodies the fiat standard, how the fiat work, standard works, if you want the algorithm and the protocol behind it, the way it runs behind the scene, Instead of you know having miners and nodes and software and uh, uh, forks and all of those things, you have one entity that has a monopoly on determining the money supply for society. That same entity also is a monopoly on international payment settlement, and it's also a monopoly regulator of banks, and it holds all the reserves for all the banks. And you know the extra bonus is that it's always ready to lend for your government. Combine all of those four together, and you can see how the fiat standard protocol functions. Um, and so, you know, if you really want to think about how it works, I think a good way of thinking about it is that it's a violent, autocratic shitcoin that fully controls its user. It's like the exact opposite of what Bitcoin does. 
it's a shitcoin because, um, uh, well, shitcoin because of the supply, but first it's, in, it's involuntary, it's coercive. You can't just download the software if you want to. You can't uninstall it. It's malware that throws you in jail, basically, if you don't run it. You have to use it, and if you don't use it, you know, you go to jail and your life is over. A uh, node count is only one. There's one node, full node, the US Federal Reserve, and uh, you know, they think this is efficient and it's much better. The network token is essentially debt. They use some kind of different nomenclatures in each different tribe with their own implementation. They have different colors and names and they have pictures of their leaders and names of their gods on the papers, but really what the actual token is, is debt. The, the, in this monetary system, money is debt. And this is a very important point to keep in mind. And mining, the process of mining, you know, in a civilized protocol like Bitcoin, mining is done based on uh, proof of work. In, uh, and you know, when you mine, you increase the supply by making new coins when you solve the proof of work. In the fiat standard, mining is done through lending. When you lend more money, you're creating new money. This is a very important thing to understand about the uh, current monetary system left over from the 20th century, is that when you make a new loan, if you borrow new money, the bank is effectively creating new money. The money supply is increasing. So whereas in Bitcoin, every time you mine a block, a new coins are created for the next 100 years or so, in fiat, um, every time a bank issues a loan for somebody to buy a car or a house or anything, or you know, companies buying each other, new money is being created. And the effect of, uh, the, the thing that's like the proof of work is obtaining a lending license. The way that you can increase the money supply, instead of solving a proof of work in you know, advanced protocols, you just get a license from somebody in government that tells you that you can lend. And then if you're able to lend, you're able to create money. And the monetary policy is essentially infinite inflation forever. And they have all kinds of voodoo justifications for all of this stuff, which are not worth getting into. But basically, this infinite inflation progresses at haphazard rates every year. You go somewhere between you know, negative 2 to plus 10 to sometimes 30%, sometimes 50 sometimes 500%. It's, um, it's, it's a very erratic protocol in how it functions. And um, the record of transactions is available only to government, basically, and its spy agencies and their corporate sponsors who are able to obtain it. But you can't look at everybody's, uh, you know, you don't run a full note. You don't get to see everybody's transactions, but some people get to see yours. And so um, it's important to emphasize a few points that they have a very primitive way of doing proof of work. You know, in Bitcoin, we have a very competitive free market process that allows anybody in the world to mine a Bitcoin as long as they're able to solve the proof of work efficiently. And so everybody's always trying to figure out the most efficient, fastest, best way of solving and creating more money. In the fiat standard, you just need a license to issue a financial institution. Or, you know, you're a government and you print money uh, and you sell bonds and then the central bank buys money from you, uh, buys the bonds from you with new money. And the critical thing, of course, is the difficulty adjustment in Bitcoin. My favorite thing about Bitcoin the fiat standard doesn't really have a difficulty adjustment. It's, it's a, instead of you know, the software deciding how hard it is and how many coins are introduced, a million rules and a million laws determine who can issue credit and when and uh, when and how much. And basically, because of the broken difficulty adjustment, it's very easy money. The stock to flow ratio, if you look at the last 50 years, for 55 years, from 1960 to uh, 2015, I have this data in the Bitcoin standard, the average supply of the average national currency every year increased by about 30%. So that's a stock to flow ratio of three, which is, you know, very, very bad. Um, it's constantly increasing in, in, in supply. And it's basically a self-sustaining gravy train because government violence grants banks a monopoly on the issuance of credit and international settlement. You can't just send money outside of your country without going through your central bank. It's a monopoly that's enforced by government, a monopoly of correspondent uh, banking by central banks. And banks use the monopoly on um, uh, capital in order to finance government spending. So it's self-sustaining in that regard. Uh, in some imp benign implementations of the fiat standard, it's just a mechanism for 
people who are connected to government to take money from people who aren't. And that's done sustainably for a while. But in malignant implementations, when the malware is really, really, really bad, basically it can destroy the entire economic system of a society. And I particularly got wrecked recently playing with one of the stupid shit coins of the fiat standard. Um, I talk a lot about shit coins, but I was using one of those, the Lebanese Lira, and now it's uh, completely wrecked. And so remember always, never put in the fiat standard more than you can afford to lose. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the underlying essentially technology behind the fiat standard is, you, as I said earlier, a monopoly on determining the money supply, payment settlements, regulation of banks and holding the reserves, and then lending to government. Which means that the central bank's cash balance is used to back the local currency with hard currencies. Everywhere in the world this mostly means dollars. In the US, um, you know, the backing is gold. But you have other kinds of currencies that central banks have uh, that, that they hold as assets. And they use this to settle international trade. And they use it to bank all bank deposits, to back all bank deposits. And they use it to, Binance f uh, to buy government bonds. So you buy, I mean, it's just such bad accounting if you really think about it. Why would you want all of those things to go from the same purse? Why would you want to combine all of those things in the same thing? For me, it's like if you had a house, somebody spoke you into somehow combining the sewage system with the freshwater system on the fact that, hey, that way you, know, you can save on piping. And <laughs> it's obviously not very workable. And if you try to make it work, you're going to end up paying a lot of money on filtering the uh, water, which is really just very bad design. And so when you try and make the fiat standard work with those rules, it ends up just being a very extremely expensive and stupid way of running a stupid implementation of the gold standard. And really, just run it on the gold standard is much better. But, um, you know, obviously, they haven't stopped trying to make it work. The use of this means that, effectively, if you have all of that money, all of that stash used for the same thing, means that all of your savings and deposits and international trade and remittances have to go through an entity that is a monopoly and that also is tasked with lending to government. What could possibly go wrong? Everyone's money is in the same pot as the government, and there's no alternative. You can't take your money anywhere else. As long as if you want to save or trade or send money internationally, you have to go through this monopoly. So what could possibly go wrong? A lot. Well, the first thing is the universalization of debt. It's just everybody in the world is now in debt. Everybody and everything is indebted because, I think the best way to understand that is that because debt is money, the fiat standard incentivizes the creation of money in the same way that the gold standard incentivizes the mining of gold. Bitcoin, uh, the use of Bitcoin as, as money incentivizes the, um, the mining of Bitcoin. Debt issuance is the way that you create money in the fiat standard. And you know you can read more about this in um, fiat uh, economic books about how the money is created, but it's undoubtedly true that you make mo every time new debt is created, new money is created in the fiat standard. And so it's like the process of mining. And once you think about it this way, it makes sense why everybody gets into debt, and it makes sense why um, debt really is sound financial planning for most people. You, as a business, it makes sense for most businesses to get into debt. It makes sense for most individuals to get into debt because you're allowing somebody else to print a lot of money. And so that person benefits from putting you in debt. And so it ends up being you know, more profitable for you to engage in that, usually, than buying cash up front. Um, because that's just ultimately what it is. You're tapping into a process of the creation of money. And so, effectively, um, this is why everybody is always indebted. I like to use this metaphor to, to, to draw the analogy. You know, when, when in the Rai, when the Yap Island people were using the rye stones as money, they kept producing more and more of these Eventually, you know, they had very large amounts of rocks sitting there in the middle of the town square that they were using as money. And it's inevitable that with any kind of money, people are going to always do everything they can to produce more of it. 
And the reason that gold end up being so um, so superior as a monetary standard is because it becomes so hard to make new gold, and it becomes so uncertain and so toxic and dangerous that most people just give up. And instead of making gold through digging for it, they just go and decide to work for society in order to make money through uh, working. So. In, a, in, in, in an easy money like the rye stone, they start making money more and more by producing more and more money, and so you're over-investing in the creation of money. In our uh, fiat standard systems, a similarly primitive monetary system with very um, unworkable difficulty adjustment, we're over-producing debt. If you look at the world since 1950, particularly since the 1970s, you look at how much debt has just been going up, and this is debt as a percent of GDP. So it's not just that debt is increasing. Debt is increasing on top of the increase in the productivity and the economic production. So f the more we produce, the more debt we get into. And this is familiar also on the individual level. The more money you make, the more debt you can get into. You know, the, the more successful a company is, the more debt it takes on, and so on. Because this system incentivizes the creation of debt, as I was saying. And so. Um, we see this, if you look at the modern financial system, um, you see this in how everything is becoming a financial institution in the modern economy because everything engages in interest rate arbitrage. Because if you're a big company that is able to borrow at a low interest rate, you're able to create a lot of money by lending to people at a higher interest rate. So that's massively profitable. And that's why retailers and banks and software companies and all kinds of uh, people do all kinds of silly nonsense um, as long as they're able to get um, uh, close, uh, as long as they're able to get good credit, basically. And so, you know, my favorite example is um, IBM. You look at a company like IBM, it has so much money, and it gets such low interest rates, and it invests enormous amounts of money in blockchain and AI nonsense that anybody who's looked at, who knows anything about that stuff, knows that you know they're not doing anything with their blockchain. I guarantee you, they don't have a single blockchain that for anything. The only blockchain known to have worked in the wild is Bitcoin. That's it. So all of the IBM people, I'm sure, are not using Bitcoin. And yet, you know, as long as they're able to continue to get low interest rates, IBM continues to just proceed in, in this. And so um, they just, they're able to secure much lower interest rate competitors, and they're able to continue to um, operate in this. And you see it in how retailers are just issuing credit cards constantly, trying to get their consumers to borrow because Every time that a consumer borrows from the retailer, they have to pay back at a 20, 25% interest rate or something like that, whereas the, um, the, the company is able to borrow at 2% or 4% interest rate or something like that. Um, internationally, the debt slavery of the fiat standard functions through just the horrific international monetary and financial system that runs through the international loan sharks of the IMF and the World Bank who basically have access to these fiat printers of debt of the U.S. government and U.S. dollar and go around basically trying to find any way possible to shove debt down the throats of third world countries and any country actually in the world. It's, these organizations are only capable of doing one thing, which is lending money. And surprise, surprise, their answer to every solution, to the solution to every problem in the world involves borrowing money. It's funny coincidence in a world in which borrowing money is just printing money that these organizations find that it's a solution to everything. And if you look at their, um, uh, if you look at their, uh, you know, what they do is their modus operandi is they go to countries, they give them uh, voodoo Keynesian economics about how, you know, if you borrow all this money and invest it in all these projects, then you're going to get, in, you're going to become a developed country and you're going to have a high GDP and then the tax base will increase and so you'll make all of this money because you know, you're going to invest according to our modern economic uh, theories and you're going to become a first world country and you're going to be able to pay it all back with taxes because obviously this is all Keynesian central planning and it all works. And so you would expect that uh, this, you know, you'd be able to pay off all of your debt and of course they can't pay off all of their debt and they then, you know, they're stuck in a debt crisis and they're constantly repaying the debt and then it's uh, paying off the debt is just continuously growing as a part of the budget of third world countries and the IMF is constantly bailing them out and giving them even bigger doses of debt. 
if you follow the soap opera that is the history of Argentina, you see how it's just the same soap opera repeated with new characters where every seven to 10 years, they take out a new IMF loan, they issue a new shitcoin, and they start off as saying, we're going to implement reforms, and they take in 10, you know, each, each time they increase another five, 10 billion dollars in the lending, and the IMF is constantly there. You know, the last time they gave them 10, 20, 30 billion dollars, and now they're gonna blow it away and then they're going to get it again. And then why does that crazy, insane system persist? It only persists, persists because of the fiat standard. It didn't exist under the gold standard. There was no World Bank with a magic printer of gold to go hand out to third world countries back in the 19th century to make them develop. But now we do, and so we, <laughs> we hand them out debt, and that's what they're constantly falling into, and they're constantly trying to pay that off. And um, of course, the flip side of that is that currencies are constantly devalued. As I mentioned, on average, 3%, uh, 30% growth per year. And of course, this leads to high time preference decision making, it leads to people forgetting about the long term and thinking about the short term more and more. It leads to ever-growing government deficits. There's a lot of bad things here. I'm not going to depress you. I'm going to move on to the fun stuff. So let's start going a little bit quickly. Um, but you can read about it in the next book. So governments continue to grow because they can just continue to finance themselves using all of the capital that is available to all of society. And they can fight wars endlessly and just continue to uh, finance themselves. All of the despots that we've seen in, in human history have operated under some sort of proto-fiat standard which has financed them. We've never seen a genocidal maniac run on a gold standard. We've never seen genocides financed by the gold standard. Well, uh, that's not accurate, we have. But if you think about the most, uh, the most horrific genocidal leaders that we've had in the 20th century, they all uh, had their own fiat shit coins that allowed them to finance this. Um, and then of course, hyperinflation, which is uh, very, common in the 20th century, and then capital destruction and flight, people take their money out of the countries, and so all of these third world countries with these horrific uh, monetary systems are constantly losing all of their capital, and they have balance of payment and trade problems, all of this and more depressing stuff you can read about in more detail in the book, in the Fiat Standard. And then you have a monopoly of banks that are really protected from free market competition to a large extent. And then finally, of course, the most important one is just the kleptocracy that it turns politics into. Because if you are a president, if you run a country in this kind of situation, you don't have a pot of gold to manage. And if you mismanage it, you run out of gold and then local enemies or foreign enemies would kill you and then they will take over your property and you won't be king and it will be over. It doesn't work this way. You have everybody's money, and the more you spend of it, the more you are able to strengthen your position in power at the expense of your people. And so politics goes from who can run the public purse best because they have a hard money into who can pillage the public purse uh, best because they have a magic printer that allows them to continue to make money by issuing more and more government debt. And of course, the IMF and the World Bank are the big enablers of this kind of uh, responsibility worldwide by constantly shoving billions of dollars down to everybody who practices it. If you really think about it, the three drivers of um, economic growth or any kind of improvement in material life ultimately have to be capital accumulation, trade, and technological advancement. And the fiat standard massively disrupts these by disrupting international trade, disrupting capital accumulation, and disrupting people's ability to engage in long-term planning and long-term um, uh, uh, long investment because of all of the uncertainty that is involved in it. Um, and really, ultimately, I think it, th what the development industry keeps ta saying about you know these poor countries need loan and aid is very self serving because it's self-serving for the perpetuation of the development industry. But if you actually think about what is good for the, um, <coughs> sorry, if you think about what is good for the poor countries themselves, they don't need more money in the hands of central planners in the central government. They don't need more loans. They don't need more aid. They don't need more debt. They need more free market. They need more capital accumulation, trade, and technological advancement. And that stuff, you know, is not really available in the fiat standard because it is not a free market monetary and financial system. And if only somebody had a free market and monetary and financial system, something like maybe a commodity. Is it a commodity or is it a 
currency it's bitcoin and bitcoin fixes this bitcoin is really if you think about the fiat standard in this way if you compare it as a protocol to bitcoin you can see bitcoin as just such a superior upgrade and i think this is really what's interesting about it as a technology of money it's an infinitely superior upgrade to the fiat standard because first of all it is the only one that works because it's the only one that can get around government sufficiently enough to seem to have worked for the last 10 years it allows for international settlement of payments to become just a purely technological operation without recourse to political or legal systems, which I think is enormously important. You couldn't send money across international borders without going through your central bank before. Now you can do it by clicking a few lines of code. And that just completely changes the way that we um, function with money and value. And I think in the long term, it's just going to continue to um, uh, um, grow in this regard. And um, really, Bitcoin neuters and obsoletes the fiat standard. It makes it obsolete. And um, it's really, if you think about it, um, this is in a sense like the glass beads versus the gold coins. The um, monetary competition applies in this case. And Bitcoin is not gold. They can't just lock it up and ban it very easily. It's much harder. And so Bitcoin is a process of monetizing a hard asset whose supply is fixed. Whereas fiat monetizes debt, which is an easy asset. We can always make more debt. And we can always find excuses for borrowing more. And we always have an increase in the quantity of debt. So it's much easier to make more debt than it is to make more Bitcoin. So this is, again, glass beads versus gold coins. The more Bitcoin's value increases, the higher the value of the hard money economy becomes. And effectively, we're seeing two economies coexisting. But one has a hard asset and one has an easy asset at its back. And so who will win? You know, let's find out. The interesting thing is if Bitcoin continues to grow, now of course it's a big if, there are no promises, this is not investment advice, and this is just irresponsible speculation. And this is Las Vegas, we all do all kinds of irresponsible things. So take it uh, with a big bucket of salt. But if Bitcoin continues to do what it does, for the next 50 years. Think about it. The more Bitcoin is monetized, the less debt is monetized. In effect, the more uh, debt is paid off, the more people pay off debt and don't take on more debt, then the, the, the smaller the value of the fiat economy. Effectively, Instead of monetizing debt and everybody running around to monetize debt, Bitcoins allows us a, a, a technological way out in which we monetize a hard asset instead of it. And so the growth in value, the, the growth in um, money supply is limited under Bitcoin, which means that if you think about it, if, the more bit, if Bitcoin's value continues to increase more and more, then the people who hold Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin increases more and more for them. And then the value of their, uh, the part of their financial portfolio that is in the Bitcoin hard money economy increases compared to the um, uh, USD fiat standard uh, part of their portfolio, they become more and more likely to pay off their debts. Now, currently, this is a very small number of people around the world who are into Bitcoin. But if you project this continuing again for another 50 years, and number continues to go up and the value of Bitcoin continues to increase and the number of people who hold Bitcoin and witness appreciation in its value continues to increase. Big if, but you know, assuming the next 50 years are going to be say 1% are going to witness as much, 1% as much growth as the next, as the previous 10 on average. Let's say the average of the previous 10 is not, we're not gonna match it over the next 50. We're gonna get 1% of it. Even with these kinds of projections, the increase in the value of the Bitcoin economy will continue to uh, accelerate more and more and more. And the uh, number of people who are able to pay off their debts increase. And so individuals and businesses might move from a debt-based uh, financial paradigm and financial accounting paradigm to a hard asset-based financial paradigm. And you can see this happening to old-time hodlers 
if you've been around Bitcoin, it begins to happen to you slowly, slowly as Bitcoin's value increases as a part of your portfolio and then to a point where you don't need to, um, you know, if it increases to a point where you can pay off your debts and this becomes very common, what we're doing is we're reducing the creation of debt. And so effectively, we're unwinding the fiat standard. It's, it's, the, it's the neat technological solution that allows us to get rid of this giant cancer by basically just um, unplugging the increase and allowing it to just become less and less significant as more and more of the real economic activity mo moves to a hard money standard. And so this is contrary to a vision in which Bitcoin causes hyperinflation. This would be the opposite. Because what happens is, okay, people will want to hold fewer dollars because they want to hold Bitcoin, but also they're going to want to borrow fewer dollars. And the money supply is not physical bills, the money supply is debt. And so if people want to take on f less dollar debt because they just have Bitcoins and they don't care about dollars, if we move to a world in which this happens, then we start creating less and less debt. And we move effectively away from the fiat standard as being uh, the use of it. And so um, the formatting of the PowerPoint has been messed up, but you can't have everything in life. But there was a thank you there. And uh, my website is uh, safeddean.com, and my forthcoming textbook is Principles of Economics, which I've begun to write. So I'm working on two books right now, The Fiat Standard, which whose outline is uh, I just presented uh, to an extent. I'm still working on the outline of it today, so I welcome all of your feedback. But I'm also working on a book uh, which, you know, the Fiat Standard is going to contain all of the uh, ranty stuff that gets people uh, triggered. But uh, I'm going to put it all in the fiat standard so that the other book will be the principles of economics, which will be just a clean, clear uh, statement of the principles of economics. It's a textbook based on the courses that I'm teaching right now. So I've te taught um, Economics 11, the first course, and principles of economics. And then the second one begins in a couple of weeks. The syllabus will be uploaded tomorrow on my website. Uh, wait, is it Sunday today? No, Saturday today. No, so Monday, yeah. It'll be uploaded on Monday. And then the course begins in uh, a couple of weeks in March. And then those two courses are going to form the basis of Principles of Economics, my textbook, which I've started writing. You can access a draft of the textbook on, um, I if you purchase access to the draft of the textbook right now, and you, you can, on my website, you can purchase access to the draft of the textbook to see it written as it is being written in real time over the next year. And you will also receive a signed hardcover copy of the textbook. It's uh, going to be a beautiful bound hardcover edition, uh, which I'll mail out individually to people who buy. And uh, meanwhile, I'm also going to be working on the fiat standard. And there's also the Bitcoin standard, which has been now translated to about 11, 12 languages. The Italian was the last to join. And it's soon going to be translated to another eight or so. So the total is now 19. And these are the languages. So find out where your family, uh, which one your family reads and send them. And then you can send them. you'll have a whole supply of um, literature coming your way to annoy your friends and family with over the next few years of Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners. Thank you so much for joining. Hey, guys. Uh, safe left a few minutes for questions. Um, so we have about uh, about five minutes. Uh, come up to the mic if you have a question and um, ask away. There you go. We got one. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the uh, price of gold has increased like dramatically the last year. I don't think this is uh, individual people buying uh, one ounce gold coins from Peter Schiff. I think anyways that this is like central bank buying. Do you agree? And if you agree, why would they be doing this now? Like it's supposed to be a barbaric relic. The economy is supposed to be, you know, doing great, right? The stock market's all over the world or whatever. Why would they be buying or accumulating gold? Because to move the price this much in such a short period of time, I think, requires a lot more money than just individuals buying it. To be honest, I really, I really don't follow the, the gold market this closely, and I don't really see what is going on. Uh, I think central banks have been buying more and more, like in the last 10 years overall. 
there's an unmistakable trend of going from selling to buying. Um, but I don't really know if it's, um, it, it's responsible for some of the changes in the short term. What's going on it might be a precursor for a financial crisis or so on. But really, I just don't follow the analog fiat uh, monetary system as closely since I've moved on and upgraded to Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that there would be less and less debt borrowed as Bitcoin becomes more popular, but wouldn't the opposite be the case if you wanted to borrow soft money to get more hard money? Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't the debt just start to go out of control and spiral? It would, except, you know, with uh, the, because of capital controls, basically. Uh, debt controls. It's, I think it's, it's highly likely. We've already seen this happen, which is you can't buy crypto with your credit card. We've already seen things like that happen. So I think it might become more and more of a segregated uh, economic system, two segregated economies in that, um, you know, if you have Bitcoin, if you should post about it on Twitter, if you have a Coinbase account, if anywhere on the, um, you know, on, on, on all of the fiat standards surveillance, um, you've showed up as Bitcoin, you're not allowed to take on debt. I think this might happen. I think it's it's highly likely because of the prospect of uh, attack on the uh, because of the prospect of the speculative attack that people take up debt in dollars and that you know leads to more and more creation of dollars. So I think it might be that eventually you're going to have to choose between you know having a mortgage and debt and a ball and chain for the rest of your life or Bitcoin. So good luck on making that difficult choice, I think. Um, but we'll mm -hmm. see. I think I it'll be interesting if it comes down to that because then we'll have something similar to the sort of black market economy and a white market economy or the official state economy in the sort of socialist economies uh, toward the end of the Soviet Union because you have two parallel economic systems effectively. So it'll be quite interesting to see it uh, if this happens. But yeah, I think this is, this is the... Um, when we think about attack vectors about Bitcoin, you know, there's uh, there's the kind of um, uh, focus on these kind of apocalyptic scenarios. But I think this is arguably more uh, more realistic that there'll be financial penalties or financial restrictions on people who deal with Bitcoin in a certain way, and not in a way that kills Bitcoin, but in a way that maybe segregates uh, people uh, between Bitcoin and fiat. Well, say thank you, first of all, for the great intellectual foundation you've given all of us with your original book. And you are the original and first Bitcoin standard. Uh, what I wanted to ask, though, is what is the, uh, what's your view of Bitcoin dominance versus uh, uh, Bitcoin competition? Uh, and just what is, uh, I don't know, uh, what what is your view of what, uh, currency competition in is, and do you see Bitcoin maybe resurrecting the gold standard? Yeah, potentially. I think, uh, yeah, I've, I've discussed this, in, I think, in my talk here uh, last year. Repeat the question real quick. Oh, um, he's, uh, the question is uh, concerning uh, Bitcoin within uh, the uh, monetary competition and different monies competing, and whether Bitcoin resurrects the gold standard. I've discussed this, uh, I think, in my previous talk last year. I think it's just, um, I think one way of thinking about it, we don't have much time for me to restate the whole thing, but I'll just say, um, worth considering the, the scenario of, say, BitTorrent. BitTorrent shook up uh, media distribution quite significantly when it, um, allowed piracy to happen in a way that was very hard to stop and that led to all kinds of old media model having to readjust and change and now we're at a point where um, where you know uh, piracy and BitTorrent is not as popular as it used to be say 10 years ago but that is not because it's been killed it's still there you can still use it it's rather because people are not needing to pirate as much because it's uh, w w you know the business models have become so much more reasonable over time um, in the sense that you know instead of having to buy the um, 
DVD or buy the movie individually. Now people can buy packages and can, um, you know, they, you pay one fixed sum. So that there are much more reasonable business model than what was going on under the era of piracy, which uh, encouraged the piracy. But once piracy was successful, it led to the incumbents revising and having to adapt and change their business model to accommodate the um, better, um, to, to accommodate the consumers better, but it didn't really, um, it, it, it didn't really displace them completely. So perhaps there might be something like this with, uh, with, with Bitcoin into, uh, and the financial system in that the presence of competition scares them into getting their shit together and then their first mover advantage um, ends up being significant enough that Bitcoin doesn't quite take off. Maybe. We're going to have to watch and see. We'll see.